This message is one of the Times Square Pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing to World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindale, Texas, 75771, or calling 214-963-8626. None of these messages are copyrighted, and you are welcome to make copies for free distribution to your friends. Some special dispensation that is going to make it immune to judgment, you won't like the message. I don't believe America is any more favorite than, than uh, Europe or any other country. And if we uh, go the way other countries go, we're going to be judged just like they've been judged. And so we hope you will stay with us tonight in the message. And uh, I promise you that before it's all over, there's rejoicing for those who believe the word. It's, going to, it's a heavy message. And it's, uh, I may have to preach more than an hour, an uh, hour 15 or 10 or 15 minutes, but I want to get this off my heart. In preparing this message, I tried, I tried even up to an hour before I came to church, I tried to soften it. And the Lord wouldn't let me. I said, Lord, I can't preach it like that. Even some of the people who learn to trust us think I'm crazy, but I... Uh, it's in the Word. It's in the Word. I'm not preaching some dream or vision. I'm preaching you something I extrapolated from the Word. Something I found in the Word of God. It shocked me. And God said, it's time to preach. When we first came to New York City, God made it clear we were sent for two reasons. That's to find a holy remnant who wanted to go on with God in holiness and righteousness and forsake the world. God raised up a strong, holy, sanctified people in the midst of hell here in Babylon. And second, to warn of coming judgments. And having uh, found a wonderful group of remnant people, now the Lord is seeming to release us to preach more on judgment. Um, the last days of America. My message tonight. The last days of America. Heavenly Father, I need unction from heaven. I can't preach this, Lord, without your strength. Lord, I want you to give this people an open heart to receive and hear what you're saying. Lord, it sounds like a trumpet in my heart. I see a train rumbling down, getting closer and closer, and the light gets brighter and brighter. And so many people are not listening. They're not heeding. It'll go in one ear and out the other for many. But, oh God, for those who have ears to hear, let us hear what the Spirit and the Word is saying tonight. Lord, shake us tonight. God, get a hold of our hearts. Don't let us... Say yes and amen, and then do nothing about what we hear. God, what we hear tonight, cause it to shake us and turn us and change us. Lord, I can't see how any Christian can hear this tonight without being broken and weeping before we're finished. God, you've broken my heart over this message. We love America. We love this homeland of ours. But, oh God, we hear the trumpet sound. We know there comes a time when God releases a nation to judgment. And America has been released to judgment. God, let there be a people that hear it in the heart, hear it in the innermost. We don't preach it for sensationalism, Lord. We tremble tonight that you have entrusted us this heavy but important word. So we humbly bring it to you now for unction and anointing. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Beloved, America's dying. America's in the last throes of a terminal disease. My Bible says the disease is incurable, the wound is hopeless. America is going the way of all other fallen empires. The time has come that God warned us about all through time in Scripture. It's called a dread release, when even the prayers of godly saints no longer avail. Listen to what the Scripture says. When the land sins against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it, and I'll break the staff of bread thereof. That's a depression. I'll break the staff of bread, and that's exactly what it means. I'll cause unemployment. I'll break the staff of bread. And I will send famine upon it, and I'll cut off from it man and beast. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should but deliver their own souls by righteousness, saith the Lord God. Ezekiel 14, 13. God has never yet destroyed a nation or brought a people down without first warning, ample warning. The scripture says the Lord will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants the prophets. Amos 3, 7. 
God has never in history judged the people until first, loudly, he's proclaimed with trumpet sounds, he's raised up watchmen, he's raised up prophet after prophet. I'm only one of thousands of his watchmen. I believe all these pastors are watchmen. God warned Abraham of the sudden destruction was going to come on Sodom. And the Lord said, shall I hide anything from Abraham, the thing which I'm going to do? He said, I can't destroy the city till I tell Abraham, till there's time for Lot to get out. God warned Noah that he was going to destroy mankind with a flood. And Noah, being warned of God, of things not as yet seen, moved with fear. He was warned of God that something was coming, just as he's warning us tonight. God warned Samuel of the downfall of Eli's ministry and the destruction of the house of God at Shiloh. The Lord said to Samuel, I'm going to do a thing in Israel at which the ears of everyone that hears it shall tingle. Jeremiah prophesied judgment on Israel. He said, because the Lord has given me knowledge of it and I know what's going to happen. The scripture says, then you have shown me their doings. Jeremiah 11:18. God revealed what he was going to do to Daniel. Then what the secret revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Every day, in every age, just before judgment has come, God has communicated through his servants that he was coming. He's never allowed a society to be caught by surprise in judgment. Now, to Moses, he spoke face to face. He spoke to Joshua by way of an angel. He spoke to Old Testament prophets through visions and dreams. And so, once again, today, God is speaking loud and clear to America. I know there are false prophets. Some of them are madmen. You see them, they're crazy. They say crazy things. They prophesy crazy things. And the devil sends them to make it sound like all judgment messages are foolish. So it takes away from the impact of the true word of the God sent watchman. He's trying to make it sound silly and foolish. So that when you hear the true word, you will just this kind of say that's another doomsday false prophecy. Now, American shepherds have become so blind, our pastors, many of them become so lazy and sinful, God's had to raise up secular writers and cartoonists to warn America that it's dying. Have you seen some of the cartoons in our papers now about judgment on America? Did you see the picture in the uh, paper last week of the Statue of Liberty with her hands in her head weeping over the sins of America? Did you see the cartoon last week of a bloody finger appearing, handwriting on the wall over New York City, said Anarchy? Did you see the picture of a uh, police officer on big bulldozers, and there were mountains and avalanches of white powder, cocaine coming down, and they were not even making a dent because the more the bulldozer would push away, the more until finally the cocaine came right over the bulldozer. And it said America's lost. In white powder. The cartoonists have more visions than pastors. The secular writers are screaming judgments at the door. We have one economist who's just dropped out. He said it's all over. He's retiring. He's going out trying to write out the storm. One financial expert after another, book after book, warning after warning, talking about a crash. The prosperity preachers are still crying peace and prosperity. And all of these people are not even saved. Many of them Jews are hearing a sound of a trumpet. Now the Old Testament prophets of destruction were based on sound biblical deductions. These prophets were students of the revealed Word of God. They studied history. They saw patterns. They began to know the character of God. They knew the trigger points of divine judgment. They knew about His mercy, His endurance, and they also knew when God had had enough. And Daniel understood. He, Daniel understood what was coming and he prophesied about the very day and time when the uh, captivity in Babylon would end for Israel. And he knew exactly when the Messiah was going to come. He knew the Messiah would live three, three uh, he, he would have a period of ministry for three and a half years. And he would be destroyed, or killed, and resurrected. Daniel saw all this because he was a student. He, it just was not some night vision. It was not just some dream. He was a student of God's Word. He was a student of the character of God. In fact, Daniel said, I, Daniel, understood by books. What books? 
all of the law, the prophets that he had. He had the book of Jeremiah. He had Jeremiah's writings. I understood by books the number of the years to Jeremiah the prophet. That's Daniel 9 too. Daniel listed all the terrible things happening in his day. He looked at all the things that happened to Israel. Then he went to Jeremiah and he went to Deuteronomy. He went to Deuteronomy in the 28th chapter. And he began to read the curses that Moses had predicted. And then he looked at what happened to Israel. And he said, it has happened to us. He said, I know what's happened because I saw it in Deuteronomy. I'll read it to you. The curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, that's Deuteronomy 28, the servant of God, because we've sinned against him, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, for we have not obeyed his voice. Where did he get it? He got it from a pattern in the Word. He got it right there out of Deuteronomy. He read the curse and he looked at his generation and he said, it fits, this is where we're at. And he prophesied on the strength of that knowledge. Any God-fearing Christian can do the same thing that Daniel did and all the other prophets. You can look at the scripture and look what's prophesied if people do uh, what they're doing today, for example. If they sin against God and walk in stubbornness and sin grievously against God, and he warns what would happen, and then you compare what's happening with what he prophesied, and you'll know right where you are in history. Moses listed all the signs of a curse. Now, I am sick and tired of hearing preachers and teachers say that we are not under the curse of Deuteronomy 28. We have, we, those who walk in Jesus are delivered from all curses. If you walk in holiness, there's no, there's nothing the devil can touch you with. But oh, America has not been delivered from this curse. No generation has ever been delivered from this curse. He said, if you will not hearken to the voice of your God, if you will not obey my word, and then Moses lists probably, uh, there's probably 18, 20 uh, signs of this curse. I want to quickly go over about 12 uh, signs of a nation under a curse. You tell me when we're finished whether or not you believe America's under a curse right now. Go to tw Deuteronomy 28, please. Deuteronomy 28. Now I've got to get this as foundation before I go any further. I want you to look at verse 16. I'm going to quickly go down 12 signs that America is under divine judgment right now. We're not waiting for judgment, the judgment has come. Number one, first sign, the number one sign, a curse upon your city. Do you see it there in verse 16? Cursed shall thou be in the what? And cursed shall thou be in the field. Now listen to me please. Our own newspapers and magazines are calling American cities war zones. By roots. New York City, they say, has become unlivable. A murder every five hours. A crime every 20 seconds. Crack is tearing this city apart in every major city in America. And there's no turning back. Our cities are headed for anarchy. And believe me, it is spreading out of the smallest towns. We get letters from Iowa, from Kentucky, from Arkansas, from every little town in America. The same thing. Crack and murder. Violence. Our cities are under a curse. Number two, a curse on your economy. Verse 28, or, or verse 17. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. This refers to gross national product, gross national product, to banking, to all reserves, a curse upon it all, confusion, fear, and uncertainty. I will break the staff of bread. I just read that to you in my opening remarks. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. That has to be with everything that you store to all your reserves. There's a curse on it. Number three, a curse upon our futures market. All our crops and our cattle. Verse 18. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy cattle and the flocks of thy sheep. We, we have, listen, there's no question about it. We have the most disturbed futures market in all of history. Nobody knows what's happening. Number four, a curse upon our foreign negotiators. They're going to come home with shame and embarrassment. Verse 20, 19 and 20. Cursed shall thou be when thou comest in and when you go out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, which is confusion, and rebuke. And all that you set your hands to do, 
because of the wickedness of your doing. Look at me, please. Uh, you know that we, our, our government went to China and was embarrassed. They were upstaged by the communists. You know that our uh, Secretary of State has just been to Gorbachev and Moscow. He's been upstaged and he's come home with shame. It seems everywhere we go now, our foreign policy in total disarray. Total, there is no foreign policy now in America. Total disarray. In fact, the New York Times had an article the other day about the confusion of all of our ambassadors. It seems like a total state of con confusion befuddled before the whole world. Number five, plagues of incurable illnesses. Look at verse 21, 22. The Lord shall make your pestilences cleave unto you, smiting you with fever and inflammation. Look at verse 27, 28. The Lord will smite you with the boil of Egypt, scabs that cannot be healed with blindness, madness, panic of heart. Look at verse 35. The Lord shall smite you with a sore boil that can't be healed from the sole of the foot to the top of the head. You know what that sore boil is? It's the purple boil of AIDS. It's the purple boil that will not heal. That open boil, that open sore that will not heal. Number six, you're going to have areas of drought, drought, and dust bowls. Look at verse 24. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven it shall, it, it shall come down upon you. In other words, God says, and there's another scripture that says, I'll cause it to rain in one place, and the next time it'll not be raining. He said, I'm going to make a drop over here and wet over here. And that's what we're seeing right now. We've seen it now for the past five years in America. Number seven. You're going to be insignificant, uh, or the insignificant frail enemies are going to put our armies to chase. Look at verse 25 and 26. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before your enemies. Thou shalt go out one way before them and flee seven ways. Your carcasses shall be meat under the fowls of the air. Now think of it for just a minute. Think of the stalemate in Korea. We did not win the war in Korea. When you think about the picture you used to see on television of American troops running not seven ways, but a hundred ways fleeing out of Vietnam. It, 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 did you see us flee from Lebanon? Did we not run from Lebanon? And now little tin gods like Khomeini, we can't touch him. A little tin god in Panama, we can't touch him. Number eight, an epidemic of divorce. Broken homes and families split apart. Look at verse 30. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another, another man shall lie with her. You shall build a house, and you'll not live in it. You'll plant a vineyard, and not gather the grapes. Is that what's happening in America right now? The number one divorced nation on the face of the earth? Our families being split apart? It's all puff. It's either part of the curse. Number nine, a wave of bankruptcy. Look at verse 31. You're... Thine ox shall be slain before your eyes. Thy donkey, he's talking about your livelihood, that's your job, they, this was their livelihood, shall be violently taken away from before your face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given to thy enemies, and there'll be no one to rescue. You know, we're, we're facing that wave of bankruptcies right now because that's a part of the curse. How many SNLs have banks struck now in the United States? One hundred billion dollars worth! And here it is. God is taking away our oxen and our livelihood. Number 10, the loss of an entire youth generation. Look at verse 32. And this is what breaks my heart. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. Thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long. There shall be no might in thine hand. He said, you're going to be a generation, you're going to be a people that stands by, a nation that stands by and watch someone else come and take your children. Drugs, alcohol, sex, violence. Number 11, the prosperity of other nations at your expense. Verse 43, strangers... Look, look, look at verse 43 here, please. The stranger that is within thee shall get thee up above thee, very high, and thou shalt come down very low. I've already told you, go out here at Times Square, look at all the signs. Look, Japanese, German, everything. Ten years ago, there wasn't one of those signs. They're the ones lifted high above it. It's a very visible picture of this church, right outside the door of this church. 
Japan has become the number one nation in the world now economically. We are coming down while nations around us are going up at our expense, the Bible says. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Gray hairs are peering on his head here and there, and he knoweth it not. Strangers shall swallow them up. Hosea 8, 7, strangers shall swallow them up. Number 12, you will become a debtor nation rather than a lending nation. Look at verse 44. He shall lend to you, and you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. In five years, America's gone from the number one loaning nation to the number one debtor nation. We owe more money than the rest of the world. We are a debtor nation now. We are deep in debt. And if the Japanese pull out from our stock market or from our government bonds, we are gone. We've been supported by Japan right now. Now you tell me this curse is not present. You, you tell me that this is not America right now. Now I want to tell you, I'm going to take you to the Bible now. It's just, that's just the little groundwork now. Because, you see, there was another city that's been prophesied, typical to New York, and represents New York and America, the Babylonian system. And it was Nineveh. Now, three prophets went against Nineveh that I can name and prop that Jeremiah preached against it, Ezekiel preached against it. But uh, Nineveh was the capital of the mighty Assyrian Empire. It was the New York City of its day. It was 30 miles in circumference. It was made up of four provinces, like four, just like New York City, like Brooklyn, Bronx, uh, uh, Manhattan, Queens, it, four different smaller cities comprise Nineveh. Now, keep in mind, please, that God sent, uh, the first prophet was Jonah that was sent to this great city. In fact, God called it a great city. He said to Jonah, go to that great city. His wickedness has come up before me. In fact, Nahum the prophet said, it's a bloody city full of lies and robbery. Now, this, this city was so majestic then it had a wall around it a hundred feet high, and it, the wall is like the China Wall. The wall was wide enough for three chariots to race abreast, right down its roadway on the top of it. It had 1,500 towers, 250 feet tall. It had wide boulevards with huge palaces to all their false gods. It was the commerce World Trade Center of its time. It was a World Trade Center that focused on ivory, all kinds of spices. Fancy cloth, uh, it, it was the gold, jewel, silver capital of the world. This, they, they, they imported and they, uh, ab uh, they swallowed up every import around them. It was a majestic city, but it was full of lies and full of robbery. And God sent the prophet Jonah. Now we know at the time that Jonah came to Nineveh, there were 120,000 children under the age of seven. And so, that would mean that there was at least a population of 600 to 700,000 in Nineveh at the time. And at the preaching of Jonah, Nineveh repented, in a way. A very short-lived repentance. It didn't last long. God spared the city for a while. But that repentance was short-lived. They went back to their sins. They went back to the way they were. It was a shallow, empty repentance. So God began to say, bring other prophets. He brought Nahum, and he brought Zephaniah. Now I want you to follow me, please. Nineveh, this Assyrian capital, flaunted its bloodshed, its wickedness and immorality was exported all over the world. This, this is less than 40 years, a generation after Jonah had prophesied, and after God had spared the city. Another generation came that was more wicked than the one that repented under Jonah. And the Spirit of God came upon a prophet by the name of Nahum. And I want you to turn to Nahum, please. Turn to Nahum. Because I'm going to be preaching a lot out of Nahum tonight. Beloved, will you, will you hang in with me? Because this is one of the most important messages God's put in my heart. You must hear the heart of God on this, please. Nahum. We just leave it open to the first chapter of the book of Nahum. Would you go to verse 2, chapter 1? The burden of Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum. Verse 2. God is jealous. And the Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and reserve his wrath for his enemies. 
Verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord is going to have his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the clouds of the, the clouds of the dust of his feet. Now look at me, please. Leave it open there and look this way, if you will. Nahum looks at Nineveh. He looks at the bloodshed. He looks at the curses that are upon it. And all these curses I'm talking about are in operation at this time in Nineveh. He sees the drunkenness, the pleasure, the success, the prosperity. He sees the people at ease. They're shedding blood, they're robbing, they're full of pride and greed and violence. And he cries out, woe to Nineveh, God's going to do it again. He knew God was going to do something, and he based that prophecy on something he'd read, something he knew in his study of history and the Bible. The prophecy of Naaman, Naaman comes later, he said, God's been slow to anger. He waited under the preaching of Jonah, and now... God comes with the final message. He's been long-suffering. He's been patient, slow to anger. Now, Nahum's prophecy, there's three chapters here, and his prophecy about the coming destruction is based on the revealed Word of God. It was not some dream. It was not a vision. Nahum was a student of the Word, a student of history, and like Daniel and all the other prophets, his prophecies were based on deduction from the Word of God. And he was anointed in those deductions. He was anointed because he saw it, and that Word was there, and it's always fresh, it's always real. God doesn't change His Word. He had studied the history of another society in Egypt. He studied the history of a city, the Egyptian name is Thebes, but it Thebes, and uh, the Hebrew name was No Ammon. No Ammon was a city in Egypt, the city of the Pharaohs, that had been destroyed a number of years before this prophecy. And I know that Nahum studied because he gives a very vivid description of his destruction. Uh, the city of No Ammon was a city of Pharaohs. It was 27 miles in circumference, 10 times the size of London. Uh, at the, uh, well, that would be 20 years ago. London has spread out a lot since, but it was, it was a massive city. They had boulevards with, with uh, these temples to all their gods. It was a city that was full of gold and silver. Merchants traveled around the world. Same setup, the same uh, uh, thing as Nineveh. A huge city with walls about it. It was the great city. In fact, it was such a mighty city. Uh, it was during the 18th to the 21st dynasties of the Pharaohs. And that city, though the world at the time thought that city could never go down, that society is the greatest society in history. The Bible says it came down. God brought the city of Noah down. I want you to follow me, please. It was a city full of temples and false gods. Behold, this is Jeremiah saying, I will punish the multitude of Noah, Ammon, and Pharaoh, and Egypt with all their gods. It was a city of false gods. Ezekiel prophesied against that same city. God will execute judgment against no, cutting off the multitudes of that city. It had been an impregnable city. It was surrounded by waters. The sea surrounded it on three sides. Waters were round about it. Her rampart was the sea, and the wall was from the sea. In other words, her protection was the sea. There was only one way to get to this, uh, this area, to the city. And that was well protected, well fortified. Bible says, listen, look at chapter 3, 10 of Nahum. Third chapter. Verse, let's start with verse 8. Art thou better than populous No, which was situated among the rivers that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, and her wall was from the sea? Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength. In other words, she had satellite nations strengthening her. It was infinite. Infinite means impregnable. Nobody can touch the city. They thought it would last forever. Putin Lupin were their helpers. Yet was she carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in the pieces in the top of all the streets. And they cast lots for her honorable men. And all her great men were bound in chains. Uh, would you look this way, please? Look at me. Here's, here's the principle. If you, you've got to understand the principle to understand my message tonight. Here's the principle. He goes into history and he sees the nature of God. He sees how God deals with these cities and the trigger point. 
He says, I want to know what there is about you here in Nineveh that makes you think you're different. Here's a society just like yours that reached this point, and God came in and wiped it out. He said, who are you? Art thou better than populated? No. And I have every right to ask that question of every American right now, all of you that hear me right now. Are we better than Sodom? Are we better than Nineveh? Are we better than no? All these cities God destroyed when they reached this point. Are we something better? This was the message of the prophet then. Are you better? What's different about you? God destroyed all other empires when they reached this point. Why would he spare you? Now there's the principle. And we know he's a student, and in fact, I believe he, he, I, I know that Nahum could have spent hours with you, with us, describing that city, all the things that happened. He had history in his hand, he had Jeremiah at his, his disposal, he was reading these prophecies, and oh, something came when he saw this, he said, oh, he did it to know he's going to do it to Nineveh, because we're at the same point. Look at verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. Would, would you look at me, with me, at verse 11? 311. This is a message to Nineveh, also to America. Thou also shalt be drunken. Thou shalt be hid. Thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. Now let me tell you what that means. You too are going to be drunken with lust and drugs and violence and evil sex. You're going to be intoxicated with success and prosperity. And it says you will be hid. And in Hebrew, the meaning is you will be left powerless. You're going to be reduced to nothing as a nation, unable to take action, unable to solve your problems. And what that means, you will be hid. It means you're going to live in a time when the problems are so great they can no longer be solved. You can no longer just make your way through. They're all going to come to a head. Listen to me, please. I believe what he's saying is your society is going to crumble under the weight of unsolvable problems. Up to now, America's been able to stumble through. Somehow we've made it. I mean, crisis after crisis, we seem somehow, and that's what the American mindset is now. We've made it before, somehow we're going to, we'll, we'll just triple through it. Not anymore. Because the problems are going to accelerate. You look at the hospital system in New York City and the United States, and it's unmanageable right now. Did you see the paper last week? Drug addicts here in New York City hospitals are walking right out of the room, going to get the crack, coming into the room. They're even free facing in the rooms. They're killing doctors, they're killing nurses, and our hospitals are quaking in fear. One hundred hospitals have been shut down this past year. Our jails are overflowing. They're releasing criminals now because we don't have any place to put them. We're trying to make prison barges and put them here in the East River. Our jails now have become horror houses of rape and violence and hopelessness. There's absolutely no cure. There's no solution in sight. Our courts can't handle the caseload anymore. Judge after judge has been screaming, we're on the brink of anarchy. We can't even handle the caseload. It's hopeless. Our schools are the shame of the whole world. Our city schools, their buildings are decaying. The teachers are living in fear. They become a miniature hell where our kids have to face drugs and guns and knives and drugs and violence. Our welfare system's in total, total chaos. New York City's asking the New York State to take over its welfare system. It can't be handled. Nobody in this government, nobody in our Congress, nobody in Wall Street, nobody in the Federal Reserve, nobody can tell us what's happening in this country or to our economy. They don't know. It's out of their control. It's beyond everybody now. Now there's a trigger that sets off the awesome judgments of God. God, listen, there's a point where God must act, where God must send judgment. I want to show you that trigger point. Oh, the Holy Spirit showed this to me and I tremble at it. Chapter 1 of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 11. Here's the trigger point. You tell me whether or not we've reached that trigger point. There is one come out of thee, 
that I'm acting as evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Now let me tell you what that means. This is a consensus. This is a national mind. This is a voice that's coming up. And here's a nation, and here's what it means. There's something that's arisen out of your nation. You are not neglecting God now. There's a voice coming forth that has declared war on God. And you know what it is? It's our Supreme Court. It's the judges of our land. It's the general voice of America. It's the national mind now. We have reached the point that if the majority of American people were against abortion, it wouldn't matter because a group of all backslidden, godless men sit there in Washington, D.C. One has arisen among us who has declared war on God. There's blood on their hands, evil old men, God-haters protecting baby killers and atheistic rights. They've shaken their fists at God, daring Him to react to their flaunted rebellion. Okay, sir, I'm going to tell you why I'm not upset that anything the Supreme Court does. They can do what they please. I don't give a whit. W-H-I-T, whatever that means. I wrote it down. Is that a word even? I don't know. I don't give a hoot. You know why? Look at verse 13. For now will I break his yoke from off of thee, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. The day is going to come, God is going to shake this nation, and those men in the Supreme Court are going to tremble. They're going to tremble and say, what is happening? It's beyond them all. Not one of their laws will be able to stop it. Not one of their decrees can stop it, because God is in control. My Bible said, who can stand before his indignation? Who's going to abide in the fierceness of his anger? Do you think those old men are going to be able to stop the judgments of Almighty God? Oh, oh, oh. oh, they're going to tremble and turn ash and white and say, what's happening? They'll turn one to another. There'll be no answer in the book. There'll be no answer in the government because things are spinning out of control. They can make all their laws and decrees and nothing will hinder it. Now, like Nineveh, our wound is incurable. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 19. Now, it, it, I read your scripture when I started that when God declares judgment, He said, there'll come a time I release a nation to judgment. It wouldn't matter if these godly men in it were in it. They'd only save their own soul through their righteousness and their prayers. Look at verse 19. There's no healing of thy bruise. No healing. And no more healing. Thy wound is grievous. That, that means terminal. Is that in your Bible? Now, I'm going to get to the heart of my message now. I'm going to give you four... That boy, I'll tell you what. If, 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 I, if, you're not being, if you're not hearing yet, if you can't hear this, you'll not hear anything that I'm saying. I'm going to give you four specific judgments that God inflicts on the nation that's going down. These judgments appear, they'll, they'll appear in a slight form, and then they'll accelerate until it becomes an avalanche. And these four judgments have already started, and they're going to accelerate until finally America is brought down like the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire, and all the past empires. We're going down. No question. All right, here's the, here, here it is. Here are the four judgments, terminal judgments. Number one. No end of corpses. 3-3. Three, three. Chapter 3, verse 3. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there's a multitude of slain, and a great number of carcasses, and there's no end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. Nahum is seeing something incredible. He's seeing something unbelievable. He's looking at a city at the height of its prosperity. The, the shops are crowded with shoppers. The streets are full of party goers. The economy is blazing red hot. And all he can see is bloodshed on the streets. He sees corpses laying all over the streets. He sees people immune to death. He sees people stumbling over corpses. And if you would have preached that on the streets of Nineveh at that time, nobody would have believed you. But here comes the prophecy. When the judgment of God comes, it's coffin time. 
It's casket time. It's death time. There's a multitude of streets, no end of their corpses. When judgment is come, you can start looking for caskets to appear in growing numbers. There's a terrible scene that's emblazoned in my mind. It's President Reagan and Nancy Reagan lined up before 250 caskets of the men brought home from Lebanon were blown, many of the caskets empty. Remember the scene of the President of the United States with his head down in tears and the whole nation wept? No end of corpses. Do you remember that horrible scene with the President standing in front of five caskets, five astronauts? Ship blows up. Again, the President weeps. President Bush. 35 to 40 casket sailors killed when the gun blew up aboard ship. Since then, there have been two other accidents, another one today, two more killed. In the days that are ahead, there are going to be so many corpses. America is going to become immune to it. We're already stepping over beggars, and it's just another time and we step over corpses. We're going to see the day that we're going to see dead people on our streets from starvation. I, I tell you, I, I have to get this into your heart. A 14-year-old mother, two weeks ago here in Bronx, 14 years old, she didn't want her mother to know she was expecting a child. She went in the bathroom and delivered, tossed the baby out the fourth floor, into the back alley. And the people who looked out thought it was an abandoned baby doll. And that little girl went to the bathroom for four days and washed her face and combed her hair and didn't even look out the window at her baby. The officers that picked up the baby wept. Last week, a three-year-old baby was found in a dumpster on Ninth Avenue. It was wrapped in a plastic bag, one of hundreds of little abandoned corpses found in New York City now. Did you see this in today's paper? Murdered girl buried in Brooklyn, the firefighters. She was abused and abandoned in life, but now she's adopted and loved in her death. She was just a toddler, three years old, found burned to death in a suitcase dumped amid piles of trash in the vestibule of 2045 Union Street, an apartment house in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Heartbroken by the tragedy and fearful that the nameless, unclaimed child murdered on April 17th would be buried in Potter's Field, the firefighters at Ladder Company 120 and Engine Company 231 in Brooklyn arranged the funeral and burial. Yesterday she was eulogized at a tearful, highly emotional mass at St. Camilla's Church in Rockaway Beach. I had no idea, to, I had an idea to give this baby some type of dignity in her death, said a firefighter. She probably didn't have any dignity in life at all. And trucks from the engine and ladder company stood outside the church and the firefighters, fire, firefighters wept. They took the casket in the church, carefully cradled, cradled the tiny white casket in their arms and carried her into the church. They stood silent at attention as if paying final respects to one of their own, a little lone bagpiper plated funeral dirge. And we've got preachers in America preaching peace and prosperity. Where are they? Are they blind? There shall be no end of your corpses. Tell me we're not under judgment. You can't pick up your paper in every page. The young man who murdered for the third time last night was out on bail on two dollars after two murders. America's dying. This is the end of side one. You may now turn the tape over to side two.